All right. Uh, week 14, 4710, we're actually doing an in-class recording this time. Um, so again, thanks everybody for uh, coming today. Uh, this week's uh, lecture is on cryptography, chapter 13. Um, and cryptography, you've had, if you've had it in 4670, you've heard me lecture on this, this topic before. This, we're going to look at crypto from a perspective of hacking. And from a pen tester's perspective, this is the last thing you want to come across because this just makes your life a lot, lot, lot harder uh, to do a pen test to do your job because it's that additional layer of security that otherwise you would not have to try to break through. Okay. Um, typically, from a pen tester's perspective, what you will be working on from a cryptographic attack, more than likely brute force attack, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and more often than not, reversing a hash or cracking a hash or trying to find uh, uh, the keys to crack a hash. So that is at its fundamental level what this chapter is all about. Okay, but like everything else, they kind of go through the basics of crypto. And this is one of the things I've noticed in all the different um, certification tests. When in doubt, add crypto questions because they're like hard or they, they think they're hard. You think that they're going to be hard, but they're really not. There's only a finite uh, number of concepts to really understand with cryptography. And in this slide here, slide number two, this is kind of it in its simplest form. So learning one aspect of crypto for the CEH, guess what? It's the same crypto concepts for Security Plus. Guess what? It's the same crypto concepts for CISSP. Guess what? It's the same. You see the theme? Okay. You learn it once, remember it, and take it away. You'll use it again. OK, I have had I have seen literally like the same certification questions on the CISSP. Right. And the CASP. And um, I haven't taken the CEH yet, but uh, I, I've also seen similar questions in Cisco uh, certification exams on cryptography. OK, they recycle these things. I don't know why they just do. All right. But we're going to look at definitions, basic definitions of cryptography, what ciphers are, how ciphers are used, the difference are what is symmetric and what is asymmetric cryptography, the difference between the two. And honestly, those two concepts there translate across all different certification. And then, there, then a little bit different here in CEH, where they're going to they're gonna touch on hybrid crypto systems. So what in the world is cryptography? Well, from the Greek Greek uh, language, hidden or secret secret writing. The process of obscuring information, hiding information from being read or understood. All right, and it's been around for thousands of years. You can actually trace back cryptography all the way to the ancient Egyptians and hieroglyph and hieroglyphics. I didn't say that right. Hiero Glyphics. There we go. <laughs> um, the thing I do like about uh, the uh, the text is they do not give you a history lesson. There's a lot of history behind cryptography, and I want to skip over that. It's great reading. It's fun for a Sunday afternoon. I don't like to teach it. It should be taught in a history class, not in a modern cybersecurity class. But they do touch upon it a little bit here. Uh, the Caesar cipher or the rotation cipher are what is commonly referred to as a ROT, R-O-T. Um, it's where you take an alphabet and you overlay the alphabet and you shift everything a certain number of letters, right? Right. So if you have a, uh, a ROT3, an A now becomes a D. You shift it over three letters, B, C, D. Right. You have an M and M now becomes N O P. 
You see how that works? And you can also have a negative rot, right? So a rot minus five, and you go back five characters. All right? That is the premise of a Caesar cipher, okay, or a rotation. The key is the number of letters that have been rotated. And very simply put, there's only a finite number of combinations that we can do. Now, in modern computing, to crack a Caesar cipher is extremely easy. It doesn't take a lot of effort. We're not dealing with translation of lowercase to uppercase. We're not using any numbers, all right? We are only dealing with the lowercase letter uh, alphabet. So as you can see here, we have the rot uh, uh, three. Uh, the Ving Vingre cipher is a rotation, a uh, simple rotation cipher as well. They use a consistent key from letter to letter. Once that rotation value is known, all letters can be determined. All right? This is similarly called a substitution cipher. Uh, once the rotation value is known, uh, I'm sorry, the cipher makes it much harder to decipher using a grid of two alphabets. So instead of having um, an A is now a D, we have a grid where we do a substitution. But again, not very hard complex math underlying these types of ciphers. And they can be analyzed very quickly and decrypted very quickly. The ciphertext is the intersection of the letters from the key on one axis and the letter from the plain text on the opposite axis. Okay, so we have a grid. We have a rotation cipher like a Caesar cipher. We have A through Z, and then A to, uh, and then the 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 chain. So if it's a rot three, we'll start with D D E F and go down, and then we have we place a grid overlay over that that we can randomize to a certain degree. Right, and then we have the intersection, uh, which would replace or substitute that letter. Encryption attacks. Um, there are two different types. The most common, like I said before, is the brute force attack. And the brute force attack is just nothing more than trying to figure out what the plain text is from the ciphertext. We can also try to break keys using a brute force attack. So if we can delineate the algorithm, for example, then it's a matter of, okay, what's the password? What is that key? What is that variable that I need to input in the into the mathematical calculation to reverse a ciphertext? Frequency analysis is often used in conjunction with brute force attacks. All right, and every language has a frequency distribution of letters used in all the words in the language. So if we're looking at a simple, like Caesar cipher, what letter do you think comes up most in the English language? E, exactly. So if I have more um, H's in my cipher text than any other letter, what is a good bet that an H is? An E. So then I know that I have a rot three, right? I've just shifted over three letters. I can then try to reverse it. So that's the premise behind frequency analysis. And you can use automated tools to find that very, very, very quickly. Again, works with simple ciphers. Now, we've come a long way over the last couple thousand years right? And we uh, have more intensive mathematical algorithms that we can put into the computation of ciphertext, okay? But it's a matter of defining what algorithm we're going to use. So if we use a published algorithm, say like DES or triple DES, or even AES, and we can ascertain that it is DES or triple DES or AES, Okay, we now know what? We now know the math behind it. Okay, where crypto gets 
complicated is when you have closed systems, okay? And for those of you who are wanting to go work for three-letter agencies like the NSA in particular, if you go work in crypto for the NSA, this is what you get to do. You get to not only work with cryptography, you get to develop cryptography. You get to write new cryptographic algorithms, okay? This is why the NSA loves to hire people out of math background and science background, okay? Because they understand the mathematical development that goes into cryptography. But they may not understand, at least at first, the holistic view of how cryptography is used, whereas that's what we get with the CS and CIS programs more than anything else. You, you're on the uh, application side of it, not the development side of it. So it's all about keys. So when we get into talking about symmetric cryptography versus asymmetric cryptography, the big difference is the number of keys that we're using. So the key is basically your password. It is used to either encrypt or decrypt or both um, your message. Key sizes are uh, not comparable across different types of encryption, decryption algorithms. That's very true. Your key size is very important. And it's important to understand the difference between key size and key space. Key size is nothing more than how long that key is. Is it eight characters, 16 characters, 26 characters? Your key space is important as part of your mathematical calculation for your algorithm because it tells you what you can put into the key. Letters, numbers, not just letters, but uppercase letters, special characters, and the more you expand that, the harder it is to try and reverse the key and then ultimately reverse the cryptographic message. Within a single encryption mechanism, you can compare key sizes. Yes, absolutely. Because a lot of cryptographic algorithms have what we call padding. So when we compute, especially you see this in hashing, when we compute a hash, if we have any type of pad, there might come out at the very end of the hash some non-randomness, all right, where you see a bunch of X's or X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, or 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. You see a pattern, and then you can see, oh, that's where the pad is, okay? And that's just data that is put in at the end of the computation because we've already calculated the, the key or the hash based on what limited resources we've used, the key space and the key size. Protecting key, the key is the most important thing in cryptography. Key management is a big, 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 big deal, okay? It is easier in asymmetric cryptography for key management than symmetric cryptography. Because if we have a shared key, guess what? We got. I, I have to give you the key to decrypt and we're using the same key to pass information back and forth. Well, how do I know he's gonna take care of that key? He's just not like gonna like put it in a notepad on his desktop and somebody else is gonna find it, All right? Kind of an extreme case, but very true. Whereas with asymmetric cryptography, we can use um, foundational uh, systems like PKI, public key infrastructure, to manage our crypto. All right, so the basis of symmetric cryptography and with a lot of different... Um, courses, they put set different types of emphasis on symmetric and asymmetric. So the takeaways here, know that symmetric, your, your keys are shared, right? And they go over a few of the encryption algorithms that are symmetric. 
in this case DES and triple DES, and Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. Um, they're very fast, okay? They're very fast. And they are used primarily for real-time communication. So, encrypted voice, encrypted video, encrypted streaming, okay? You're going to use a symmetric uh, methodology, all right? Because if you use asymmetric, it slows things down. It's more processor intensive. Uh, current key sizes for AES, 128, 256, and 512. Asymmetric. Asymmetric is more complex, but more secure. You see asymmetric that is used in um, a lot of online applications, pretty much anything that is using a HTTPS. We have a public key infrastructure that is used for that. Now, that said, um, keys are still issued by the uh, website that you are visiting, right? So if you're going to your banking website, they're not they're not going to give you their private key, but they're going to issue a public key so that you can decrypt information. And remember, most information that is being transmitted downstream um, is encrypted. We don't have a whole lot of stuff that goes upstream that is encrypted. Uh, not that you can't. It's just typically. Mm, we have primarily uh, traffic going flowing in one direction, and that's and that's uh, downstream. But there are two different uh, mathematical uh, layers, public and private. So depending on what you're talking about, and public and private can be interchanged quite a bit depending on the solution. Uh, SSH is a good example of that versus your traditional HTTPS. Um, you encrypt typically with the private key and decrypt with the public key, all right? So if I'm sending you a message, if I'm sending you an email, I'm gonna encrypt it with my, public, with my private key, but I have to give you my public key to decrypt it. Now, he's gonna send me a message back, he cannot use that public key to encrypt the message. He's gotta use his own crypto, his own private key, and he has to give me his public key so I can decrypt, decrypt the message. Okay. Now, that sounds like, oh, man, that's a lot harder. How is key management done there? Well, we have entire infrastructures that are built around this type of key management. Okay. Um, Microsoft has a good PKI solution. I've used it quite a bit. It can be done privately in-house, uh, especially for intranets for uh, HTTPS, or to actually uh, it leverages TLS as the encryption standard. So the encryption is done using the public key, which should be shared widely, all right? And ciphertext can only be decrypted with the private key. So here's where we get, and we get into that misconception. That's how SSH works. That's how SSH works. All right. But other types of standards, they they mix this public key, private key concept back and forth. You have to read their standard. You have to read their standard. And this can get very, very confusing. All right. I was confused and I got into arguments and almost shouting matches with colleagues about this before before I realized that, you know, hey, it depends on the RFC that you're reading. OK, so, you know, with web applications, it's that, you know, private key is used to encrypt, public key is used to decrypt with SSH, it's, it's vice versa. OK, so it depends on the application that you're using. So don't get into an argument with somebody. Reference the application because public and private are, are interchanged quite a bit depending upon the application. So, pros and cons of both. Well, symmetric keys are fast. Keep that in mind. That's a test question. You'll see that again. Um, they can be derived uh, the longer that they're, that they're used. And I'm going to give you an example of that here in a minute. 
Asymmetric keys are harder to crack. They're more mathematically complex. And asymmetric encryption is processor intensive, but it's stronger. It's much, much stronger. All right. Case in point, I think I told you guys a week or so ago about the audit that I did um, for a company out in Cleveland uh, uh, several, several years ago where I went in and SoCal Gas was evaluating their SCADA system for uh, the meters that go on to houses and the infrastructure and everything else. And they passed with flying colors until I audited their IT department. And one of the major, major finds was that they had a very simple password for their VPNs, their symmetric VPNs, and they hadn't changed it in a better part of a decade. So that was a major, major finding. And all that was really was the IT staff at this company was just lazy. Nothing more than that. They were just lazy. So you have to change out your, your symmetric keys on a regular basis. And yes, it's hard. Yes, stuff goes down. Yes, administration and business management does not like that because the last thing that you want to say to them is the word downtime. Okay, they hate that. But if you go through the proper change control process, processes, right, and you schedule it on a normal basis, you should be able to change your symmetric keys once a year. And that's good practice. So then we get into the concept of a hybrid crypto system. And typically the symmetric key is going to be used as a session key as well. And for the duration of the communication between the endpoints. So if you take that into consideration, you talk about session hijacking, you can hijack that. If there's any way that you can delineate what that key is, you can hijack that VPN very easily, the VPN connection very easily, right? An asymmetric key is used to protect the key exchange between endpoints. So what we're getting at here in this concept of a hybrid crypto system is what we commonly see in site-to-site -site VPNs uh, of major manufacturers, right, that leverage IPsec. This is the cornerstone concept behind IPsec. Because within IPsec, we have these different components. One component handles how we're going to exchange the, the key. One component is, gonna, is going to um, uh, establish the hashing mechanism for that key. Another one's going to establish what type of encryption that we're using. Okay. Another one's going to uh, set what type of authentication that we're using. So a hybrid crypto system is nothing more really what they're talking about than something like IPsec. All right. Rekeying of the symmetric key may be done for long duration sessions. Okay. So we can actually rekey or rehash the symmetric key, which gives us a longer life of the session. So, like I said, uh, other areas, TLS uses, uses this, VPNs with IPsec, uh, and encrypted email from server to server can also leverage hybrid crypto systems um, uh, as well. Okay? So S-MIME is a great example uh, there as well. It has a lot of different moving parts. So here's the big difference, or here's the big thing with crypto. All right. Uh, as a security engineer, if you have to deal with it, they're more complex. They're harder to set up. They're more moving parts. It means you make more money, <laughs> plain and simple. Uh, I've made the joke several times, the difference between a network engineer and a security network engineer is a little bit a little bit extra training and about thirty thousand dollars a year. Okay, uh, troubleshooting VPNs is is difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard. Uh, I have, you know, about lost my mind on several occasions because um, not a lot of documentation is given by some manufacturers. Now, on that note, doing VPNs between like systems like Cisco to Cisco, 
There's plenty of documentation for that. Even even like a Cisco router to like a Cisco firewall, plenty of documentation. Not very much like going from Cisco to Palo Alto or Cisco to Checkpoint or Sonic Wall to Checkpoint or things like that. Now they all do leverage IPsec. They all do leverage open standards. And they have to to be interop to be interoperable. Okay, but unless you are controlling both ends of the VPN and you're having to work through um, uh, another IT worker with whoever you're dealing with, a business partner, a customer, etc., it can be tough. It can be very tough. I've gone through a VPN setup where it's taken me days to work through that communication level. I've gone through VPN setups where we traded information, we get on a call, we're done in five minutes. We have the path established. So, you know, working with people that are really, really, really good at what they do. So, in summary, cryptography is the mechanism of hiding information securely. Simple encryption can be done with substitution ciphers, like a rotation cipher, like a Caesar cipher. Protecting the key is always the most important aspect of a crypto system, especially a symmetric uh, crypto system. Symmetric key cryptography uses the same key for encryption and decryption. Asymmetric has separate keys, public key versus private key. And hybrid crypto systems such as IPsec are commonly used to protect the key exchange of the session, symmetric key, all right, with an asymmetric key. So uh, Ike Internet Key Exchange is typically the mechanism that is used within um, IPsec, and the typical algorithm that they use is Defi Hellman. Defi Hellman has been around for wow, almost as long as I have been since like the 1970s. Yeah, it's old. Okay, so I actually like how they frame this um, this chapter. Uh, with cryptography, they kind of make it very, very, very uh, basic and at a high level. So I'm going to sign off on my recording right now, and uh, I'll get this posted uh, online.